Okay, so welcome to uh, One Bird Cage Walk. So on the call, we also have a number of people. I can't say how many people, but there's a number of people online. So the very first thing we have to do tonight is order some prizes, which is probably the best part uh, of any of these jobs is to actually recognise some achievements. So, and after we do the prizes, then we're going to go on to Tim Fox's, is Tim Fox here? Tim Fox's lecture. Uh, and we'll uh, move on to that. So the very first prize we're going to be awarding is the IMECI Bulk Solids Handling Award 2021. So the Process Industries Division Bulk Material Handling Committee has nominated Professor Ur Tuzun for the Bulk Solids Handling Award 2021. Sadly, Ur passed away at the end of last year, but we're really glad to have his partner here, Malek, uh, who has come here to receive his award. So would you mind, would you like to come and stand up? And you, thank you. So, uh, so this award is presented for is presented for either a paper published by the institution or research, design, or development in the field of solids handling. It's a recognition of an individual's professional excellence in the field of bulk solid technology. Prize is awarded by the Process Industries Division, which is division, uh, and sponsored by the Solids Handling and uh, Handling and Processing Association. Ur was a pillar of the academic and educational community, uh, in particular processing, in particular to processing, not particular processing, for many years. He was highly active within the learned institutions, including both the Institution of Mechanical Engineers and the Institution of Chemical Engineers. Uh, at both committee and board level for many years, his contribution to the cohesion of the community in the crossover between chemical and mechanical uh, was exemplary. And as a mechanical engineer who had a chemical engineer as a father, I appreciate that ability to cross over. Just had a few arguments with himself at times. <laughs> so he made significant contributions to technical research and development in the field of particulate materials, their processing and monitoring, publishing more than 120 papers in peer-reviewed journals. His research interests and activities included multi-phase process systems, engineering, particle science and technology, nanotechnology, environmental process systems and systems integration design. However, we're told his real passion and where he made his mark in, in the community was in liaison with others across the profession to shape education and knowledge transfer in his field. His untimely passing came as a great shock to all of us and who knew him and worked with him and his deserving of recognition of his achievements in this time was sadly cut short. So it was a great pleasure I have in presenting you with his Thank you. award. Proud, proud man, proud <laughs> partner. Yes, yes. yes. very sad he's not with us. Okay. I think you good. Right. So now, uh, bulk material handling award for innovation 2021. So the process industries division bulk material handling committee has nominated Hoverdale UK Limited. Uh, as the winner of the Bulk Material Handling Award for Innovation 2021 for their Halo Intelligent Belt Cleaner System. The award is presented to the author of the best paper relating to bulk material handling technology or a project presented in the preceding year. The prize is awarded by the Process Industries Division and sponsored by the Materials Handling Engineers Associated. So I'm very pleased tonight to have Linda White representing the Materials Handling Engineers Association and Matthew Beverly here to receive the award on behalf of Hoverdale. Would you come up to the front, please? Oh, right. So, upon the 
Upon the request for a renewable energy plant operator, Hoverdell UK Limited examined, researched and developed a bespoke solution which prevented significant and repeated conveyor line blockages resulting in an 80% reduction in cleaning resources, 23% decrease in downtime, 30% reduction in consumable spending and a significant cutback in maintenance. And as a person who spent the first two and a half years of his working career on a coke ovens, I appreciate how important that is. So, uh, Matthew, would you like to receive that on behalf of Hoverdale? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So that's recognition of two recipients in the field of materials handling. So now our third award is a most distinguished developing career achievement prize 2021 which is a very long award title <laughs> the process industries division has nominated abigail pinkard to be awarded the most distinguished developing career achievement prize 2021 the award recognizes those developing engineers who have demonstrated innovative and responsible professional leadership and the potential for future distinction and commitment to serving others the award looks for achievements in innovation industry research, application and or areas associated with management and or professional practices in process industries, which is a pretty tall ask for an early career engineer. So I'd like to call upon Abigail to receive her award. Because <laughs> this will just confuse, he's, you know, he's easily confused. Right, so. Unfortunately, I now have to embarrass you by reading out some of the comments from the judges here. So when I, when I say some, I'm just going to read the whole lot to make it even worse for you. So Abigail excelled not only academically at Exeter University with two Dean's Awards, but also with extracurricular activities which earned her the Exeter Award and the Exeter Leaders Award. As a graduate engineer, she gained excellent experience as a process engineer with Kerry Taste. And when I read that the first time, I thought, that's a strange name for somebody. <laughs> And then it just clicked, it heritates as a company, isn't it? It's not actually a person. And after two years, we're promoted to a project manager status, a site coordinator in the Netherlands. A measure of her employer's confidence in her abilities came about during the pandemic when she took over the role of senior project manager for the site as a result of pandemic restrictions. Abigail is an active member of the IMACE, which is good. She has been a young member of the Food and Drink Engineering Committee since 2019. <laughs> that's when you're meant to say something really positive. <laughs> that's, that's just for everyone else. That's the chair <laughs> of the Food and Drink Committee. Uh, and has been involved in presenting and chairing webinars. She's also very active in activities promoting the role of an engineer in society, whilst at Exeter, a university in Exeter was involved with the National Citizen Service and to present day serves local church as a sound engineer. You're an electrical engineer. Electrical. Yeah, electrical. Okay. Oh, good. good. <laughs> Careful, don't veer, don't veer into electrical engineering. If successful with the award, her plan is to invest the money in her CPD for herself and to demonstrate her future commitment to a professional career. Though she is in her first job for two and a half years since graduation, she has shown the quality of being capable of taking increasing responsibilities that involve making important decisions for the project under a charge. Abigail has the calibre of a future leader in the mechanical engineering profession. I suspect she already has not a future leader. I think she's probably already there. So thank you very much. Thank you. Right. And now I have to, with the wonders of modern technology, would, some, would Tim Fox please put himself on camera? Hello, Mr. Fox. Right then. I don't Good know. evening. Thank you. <laughs> you are there. Good. Right. So the most distinguished achievement award for 2021. So the Process Industries Division has nominated Tim Fox for the most distinguished Achieve achievement award 2021. The prize recognizes outstanding academic and or professional contributions to improving life through advances in mechanical process engineering. The award aims to foster and encourage mechanical process engineering research, management and other professional activities and to recognise in a substantial manner the value of the contributions and the benefit of mankind. So I'd like to call upon Tim Fox to receive this award. 
Now, at this point, I will struggle to pass this award to you, Tim, because <laughs> I don't know how tough it is. I'm not that good. So some comments from the judges, and I'm not mad my own comments. I've known Tim for a number of years, and I, I had the pleasure of taking over from Tim as chair of the board. So Tim's my predecessor. Uh, so given the influential work and contribution that Tim has offered at national and international level in the hot subjects such as climate change, energy and environmental, and in the context of challenges not only to the mechanical engineering profession, but to the entire engineering and technology sector too, he has indeed given his best with outstanding impact on policy matters makers at a very senior level. In doing so, he has also raised the profile of mechanical engineering to a beaming platform capturing the attention and respect not only the engineering community, but the wider public as a whole. And I'll add that I've actually stood with Tim and been involved in reports and Tim has presented some pretty impressive research at some pretty high levels, helping promoting uh, engineering, but more importantly, also promoting the protection of our our world as well. Uh, this is not to mention as well that the ex exemplary leadership that Tim has demonstrated in guiding and directing his team in the various board roles that he, has, he undertook in organisations in the engineering industry, learning society and consultancy sector. Tim has lived out a career, a career as a, a basically a career of most highest of, of sort of outstanding achievements and indeed deserves the award. He deserves the recognition associated with this reward and I'm Mr. Sure, for me personally Tim it's been an absolute pleasure working with you on a couple of reports now and working on the board as well so I think it gives me great pleasure to present this to you. It took me ages to write that Tim. <laughs> Thank you. And hopefully soon. Oh, <laughs> <by the way. laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm absolutely delighted to have been uh, recognised and uh, given the award. Thank you. Thank you. Um, by some means of technology, I'll get that to you. <laughs> Thank you. I'm so uh, sad I cannot be there to uh, to pick it up this evening. I'm really sad about that. I'm really disappointed. So this takes us on to seamlessly. There's a reason why Tim got his last. Because this takes us on to our tonight's lecture being delivered by Dr. Tim Fox. So I hand over to you, Tim. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Richard, and uh, thank you for the audience for coming out tonight and for joining us online. I'm just going to share my screen. It might take a, a few seconds, and uh, and then we can begin. All right. Can you see the slides instead of me? Yes, we can. Excellent. Just a bit of housekeeping for those dialing in. Any questions, if you type them into the chat, I will then relay them to Tim at suitable points or at the end. Probably, would you prefer them at the end, Tim? I think at the end would be best, Richard, yes. And the same with the audience. I will relay questions to Tim uh, at the end. So, OK, so carry on, Tim. Thank you very much. And um, as I said uh, a few moments ago, I'm really sad and disappointed that I can't be with you there in Birdcage Walk this evening. Um, but uh, hopefully you will enjoy this lecture and uh, and the networking opportunity that uh, being together in person uh, provides. So uh, I hope you enjoy the evening. So um, I'm going to talk this evening for about uh, 35 to 40 minutes about uh, the future of international collaborative engineering and very specifically about a report that I uh, produced earlier this year in association with our European region. So um, I'll walk you through the context of the report, uh, which is very, very pertinent to the world we live in uh, today, particularly within the last few months. And, um, and then I'm going to focus in on how engineers um, have traditionally uh, collaborated um, and tease out some issues associated with international collaboration specifically and look at some key challenges associated with that. Um, and then we're going to look at how uh, we're preparing engineers for uh, meeting those challenges. And, and it's very specifically, we're going to focus in on how the education sector is dealing with collaboration within the engineering curriculum. Um, I'm going to finish with a few comments about the importance of the need for international collaboration strategies and um, uh, we'll make some recommendations uh, around policy for governments and recommendations for change within the profession, industry, business, public sector, and indeed academia. 
So, as I said a few moments ago, the uh, driving force behind this report was the Institution of Mechanical Engineers Europe region, um, but it was truly a collaborative effort in its own right. Um, the report uh, was undertaken um, in collaboration with uh, members in India and members in Japan, as well as members uh, from across Europe and here in the UK. And it was a very timely piece of work because um, we began the work actually before the pandemic. And then the work had to be put on hold during the pandemic um, for very clear reasons. And then as the pandemic um, uh, evolved and the uh, vaccination programs got underway, uh, we restarted the uh, project and uh, it became very clear that actually the project was even more timely in this uh, in this period that we're living in now uh, than it would have been if we had done it uh, prior to the uh, pandemic. And uh, essentially it the, the project's uh, objective was to consider the role of international collaboration in the profession um, and very specifically within the context of dealing with the, the pressing environmental health and socioeconomic challenges that we have this century um, and how we're going to help as a profession, how we're going to help society tackle those. So the report cover is shown there on the screen and I'm going to give you a fairly um, light trot through the report and um, I would encourage you uh, if you're interested uh, to uh, deep dive into some of the detail within the report that can be found online. So let's start off with the context. Um, and this will now be very familiar ground to us all um, in, in, in terms of the, the changing geopolitics that we face globally uh, today and that have emerged in the last few months. And, um, and if we look back and think about um, the, the Cold War period, there was a very clear order at that time, which engineers played into, um, and most engineers uh, who uh, who remember who can remember working in that period will recall that it was a period of very strong focus on international collaborative effort, uh, depending on which side of the Cold War you were on, um, to engage the military industrial complex in meeting the military and defense challenges of the um of the cold war period now you know i myself am a i'm a uh, veteran of that having uh, having uh, started my career in the late 70s and being involved right from the start in uh, international collaborations um, many of which fed into those defense efforts but the other driver at the same time was that post-war growth in affluence so the collaboration wasn't just around that military industrial complex it was also around um help helping society meet the demands the increased demands of consumerism and increasing population and the um fallout demand from that for energy um and infrastructure to deliver that produce and that and, and those goods and so a lot of collaborative effort was around that commercial dimension in terms of uh, enabling society to realize its aspirations in terms of um, increased affluence and increased well-being across all sections of society. Um, and our engineering careers at that time were very much characterized by civil, military, public and private sector partnerships. It didn't matter what sector you were working in there was international collaboration within those sectors and both big and small nations were involved globally. Now, if we contrast that with today, we're in a very different uh, situation today with the collapse of the Cold War uh, world order and the new millennium ca came a transition and a, and a transition that required those Cold War military industrial complexes and alliances to reconfigure themselves and meet a different future. And that future for a very long time was very uncertain. And, and that led to a change in the nature of engineering contributions to uh, collaborative contributions into those um, programs of work. And uh, the change 
um, in the, on the economic side, in terms of the commercial collaborations, was that there was a great deal of economic uncertainty emerging and an increased threat of terrorism worldwide. So the change from a, a, a two-block political reality of West versus the Soviet Union um, to a, a very much more fragmented, fragmented global environment uh, politically meant that terrorism on a large scale um, started to emerge. And, and as part of that, of course, engineering and collaboration played a big role in um, trying to produce systems and, uh, and defences against those threats. But the main thing that is driving where we are today, and, and particularly within the last few months, has been that slow but per pervasive emergence of nationalist sentiments around the globe and, and a shift away from international collaboration towards nations who have the capacity going it alone. So this, the scenario today is very much around isolationism, pro protectionism and trade wars. And I, I would point you to the evidence uh, base in, in the global geopolitics of the recent developments in the United States. Um, you know, the Trump era was certainly very indicative of that with the uh, America First program. And that, to some extent, has continued into the Biden administration. There's been an increasing tension uh, building for the last couple of years around the US-China and Australia-China relationship. Um, and of course, uh, we couldn't have anticipated this when we were writing the report, but we highlighted the Russian Federation's increasingly assertive global position. Of course, that's really reality to us all today with the situation in Ukraine. Um, there's been right-leaning politics emerging in a myriad of European countries. And of course, we saw the Italian election a couple of weeks ago and the right wing uh, taking control in Italy. Um, and we've uh, during the pandemic itself, we saw evidence of, of this isolationism in the global response to the COVID-19 pandemic, which in many cases led to a, an emergence of vaccine nationalism. And of course, all of this uh, geopolitical political change reduces the appetite for international collaboration. So the the reality we have today is a small number of very economically powerful and resource rich nations like the United States, for example, can undertake large scale complex programs completely in isolation. They don't need the international collaboration that was so key to the world during the Cold War period. And, you know, the other 190 plus countries in the world that aren't in this um, unique position uh, cannot undertake those uh, programs of work. And those programs are absolutely vital to tackling the chronic global problems that myself and others in the institution have been looking to tackle for the last two decades. Uh, both in our careers and as part of our institution membership, which are topics like climate change and sea level rise, waste pollution and environmental degradation, the large scale demise of ecosystems and, and natural resource depletion around the world. And of course, as highlighted recently to the world in total, uh, pandemics, epidemics and, and major health crises. And these these issues are getting uh, more and more challenging as time passes us by. And it, and these issues need large scale, holistic and complex systems level responses on a global scale that are multidisciplinary, cover many sectors and technologies and geographies. So engineering is, is really at the hub of this because engineering is that boundary point between often that boundary point between science and social and economic uh, knowledge and turning it into the reality of physical infrastructure and uh, uh, products and approaches. And, um, uh, you know, we, we need to be collaborating globally, globally as a profession with many of the non-technical professions um, across sectors to achieve these global goals of 
of tackling these chronic global problems. So what is needed right now is worldwide collaboration more than ever before, and it's in direct contradiction to the trends that we're facing today towards nationalism and isolationism. So for engineers, um, we need to come together um, to advocate for change and to advocate for more collaboration and uh, help persuade the world to move towards reversing isolationism. A tall order, but it, it's something that we as a profession are uniquely placed uh, to catalyze and move forward because of our unique position in um, that whole ecosystem of moving from science to real tangible change. So let's have a look at how engineers collaborate. So as part of the project, we interviewed dozens of engineers, um, as I said, across Europe, um, in Japan, in India uh, and across the UK. And they that that research informed the um, the core of the report. And part of that was exploring how engineers today collaborate uh, both across sectors and and across nation, national boundaries. And um, some of these findings uh, were intuitively um, expected and uh, some of them were less so expected. And um, and ultimately, it was about building a, a an evidence base for for this uh, for this understanding. And in terms of collaborating today, we as engineers collaborate both formally and informally. We're doing it this evening as part of the, our role as volunteers at the IMEC E, and we do it by sitting on national and international committees. Like for example, myself sitting on BSI and ISO standard committees. Um, and many engineers do that with, as a voluntary activity within their spare time. But we also collaborate as employees in public and private, civil and military and academic settings. It's, it's often what we do uh, internally within our companies and organizations and what we do externally with national and, um, and sometimes international partners. And we do this with large and small scale strategic projects, often driving knowledge and resource sharing. Um, and this kind of collaboration is where initiatives and in innovation really start, particularly in terms of finding routes to enter new markets and take ownership of markets. So this international collaboration is absolutely essential in both our voluntary roles and, and in our roles as employees. And um, one of the key findings of that initial research work in the report was that there is there is an ingredient to successful collaboration, which is really around the goal or the mission. So the most efficient and effective and successful collaborations we could find were those where the goal or the mission is highly motivates the world, uh, the work, sorry. So think about, for example, the classic uh, uh, case, the Apollo program that motivated all that huge community of engineers, technicians, and scientists to take a man to the moon. But of course, on, on a smaller scale, we're, we're driven by goal and mission um, activities uh, within our own companies and within our responses to, um, on a broader basis, our responses to these global challenges. So, the other, another part of the ingredient, ingredient is partnerships based on pre-existing or preferred or desired working relationships. So we found lots of examples where partnerships have been forced, for example, through the, fund, the requirements of um, funding bodies, like, for example, the EU, where there had to be certain quotas um, of, of, uh, in, of uh, organizations from particular countries or particular sectors to make up the consortium that came together to bid for collaborative uh, project funding. So whereas those collaborations showed higher rates of failure and lack of success, partnerships based on pre-existing relationships or those where individuals had preferred or desired working relationships within their sectors and communities um, showed far more success. Um, collaborations that had 
complementary specialisms, knowledge and skills, where they're recognized internally within the team and, and um, you know, we're seen to reduce conflict and to lead to, again, more effective collaborations. So the goal and mission alignment was really um, the most significant part of, of what we found for efficient and effective collaboration and that sense of common purpose that drives individuals within the team and the team leaders of those teams to overcome any technical challenge or cultural differences or misaligned political systems to get the job done. And, and as so often in engineering, what we found is that uh, the collaboration, successful collaboration is less about the technology and far more about the people, the human interaction and the behavior. And within the report, we offer two superb case studies of, of these factors coming together for success. So these were both examples from the pandemic. The first was uh, Fuji Films project to triple um, a facilities batch rate in, in order to support manufacturing the no Novax COVID-19 vaccine. And the way in which the team came together to overcome the challenges of working at the early stage of the pandemic during full lockdowns to achieve this outcome was absolutely staggering and, and really based on that, that total focus on the goal and mission. And University College London's um, Institute for Healthcare Engineering's UCL Ventura team. Many of you probably saw this at the time, at the beginning of the pandemic on television, um, a non-invasive uh, ventilation form, uh, the, the, the CPAP, which is a continuous positive airways pressure form of non-invasive ventilation, was found to be very effective um, at helping patients uh, with, with COVID-19. Um, and um, and there was a real shortage of ventilator equipment within within the NHS. So the team managed to uh, reverse engineer an off patent um, design. They improved the design and had it manufactured and in hospital testing within 100 hours of the first conversation, which quite literally took place over a couple of pints in a pub where some engineers were together figuring out how, what they could do to help with the pandemic. And this involved a huge collaboration between industrial and um, academic uh, part, uh, partners um, looking to get manufacturing facilities repurposed and, uh, and product out the door and tested and, and uh, approved by the regulatory authorities. Um, Fantastic piece of collaboration. I really encourage you to take a look at that within, within the report. So let's have a look at some of the key challenges of, of inter international collaboration and, and how we that we found and how we might tackle those. So the picture on the screen is chosen on purpose. It's a classic uh, office environment now within the engineering profession. Um, and, uh, and the technology you see can can often help, of course, engineers work collaboratively, but it, it can, what we found is it can often also hinder engineers to work collab in working collaboratively. And we found that this was um, was very much the, uh, the feedback that we got from uh, the, bulk, the majority of our um, interviewees that, um, you know, all sorts of issues arise within international collaboration as a result of the ICT tools that are being used. Um, and subtle differences in language use, what language use, differences in societal and workplace culture, nuances in those that don't come across through um, ICT tools, uh, differences in understandings about behavioural norms and, and collaborative culture across international boundaries all lead to, you know, can lead to significant challenges. And these as we highlight in the report, you know, have real tangible economic outcomes, commercial outcomes for partners in collaboration. And, uh, you know, money's lost and time is lost through having to deal with, with some of these challenges. And we, we have some figures within the report that put numbers to, to those sort of losses. And, um, you know, we found that discriminatory practice and culture can often emerge in teams where there, there are these differences and, and there is a lack of understanding 
and a lack of will, willingness sometimes to address those uh, those areas of misunderstanding. And again, this came back to this issue around the goal and mission of the collaboration and the way in which the collaboration has been structured. And we found that uh, interviewees suggested a number of different approaches to tackling these challenges around building awareness, understanding and respect within the team, um, the provision of appropriate ICT tools and recognising that different countries have different preferences for ICT tools. Um, you know, wherever you work in an uh, international collaboration, you find that different nations have uh, have preferences for not only the different uh, types of, um, of uh, engineering software they use, but also the communication tools that they use. And sometimes this can be uh, quite um, quite invasive uh, for some, uh, and uh, and we you know we need to we need to uh, be mindful of that and d discuss the appropriate uh, ICT tools for any particular collaboration. But at the end of the day, what needs to happen, we found always, is personal exchange and focus face to face collaborative opportunities. So like like we've got happening there in London today, and which so sadly I couldn't join you in, that opportunity to get together and collaboratively discuss opportunities and uh, um, particular aspects of the project that, that you're working on. Um, and the education, training and skills development really does need to address uh, ways in which we can meet the, the these uh, challenges associated with uh, communication and cultural and behaviour issues within collaboration. And, and leadership needs to recognise and manage these challenges effectively. So often we found that leadership was not was very poorly um, equipped and was not um, was not empowered to deal with uh, with these uh, challenges and and. That, uh, b enabling them and empowering them is a core ingredient for for success. So, how how are engineers uh, prepare? How are we preparing engineers for for collaboration? What should we be doing? And um, these were the key findings uh, of the project. That these were the areas where um, collaborators within the, within the project felt we needed to uh, to address. So language skills uh, were felt to be very useful to develop, not, not just in terms of the ability to communicate through those languages, but, but also through the cultural awareness and the understanding that those languages bring of the behavioural norms and expectations within the countries that use those languages. So tremendous, if you like, second level learning that comes from learning a language. Um, it was felt there needed to be more emphasis on skills for establishing and managing relations across cultures and disciplines. Um, and, and that engineers should be given a grounding in the issues that can arise due to cultural differences and misunderstandings and, and be made aware of uh, tools and approaches and methods and strategies that can be put in place to avoid and, and mitigate those. Um, there certainly also needed to be, uh, it was certainly also felt there needed to be an appreciation uh, of the need to understand the, the wider context and societal framework within which the work sits. So, so often we as engineers take the technical spec and we dive right in and start designing and building things without really understanding the context and the societal framework within that, within which that project or piece of work sits. And that can get us into all sorts of difficulties um, when it comes to uh, dealing uh, with a collaborative effort that's in that's in the public domain. And there's lots of uh, examples of that within the report. Um, and we certainly need a focus on leadership skills and techniques for international collaboration. So, what are we doing about that within the within the curriculum? So, the project review. Uh, reviewed the UK standard for professional engineering competence, the UK spec. And we felt that although this report was internationally focused and, a, and an international 
a report about international collaboration, there was real value in looking at the UK standard. We had long discussions about this um, with overseas colleagues about where we should focus our review of, uh, uh, of how um, collaboration is built into the curriculum. Uh, but it was ultimately thought that through us being signatories of the Sydney and Washington Accords through the UK Engineering Council, that the requirements of our profession in the UK are pretty typical of, of the profession globally, uh, particularly in those nations that are signed up to the Sydney and Washington Accords, but also within nations that have the International Engineering Alliance and the European Network for Accreditation of Engineering Education. And um, this gave us confidence that, that looking at the UK situation would be valid in a global context. And what we were looking for was the learning outcomes uh, in the UK Council's Accreditation for Higher Education Programmes Handbook and how those are turned into uh, teaching and learning activity within academia. Uh, and by academia, um, I mean, a here we had a focus on um, primarily higher education, but also foundation degrees. And, um, and we looked at uh, engineering technicians. So in terms of the findings and outcomes of that review, we found that there was no specific requirement to develop an understanding of, or indeed a knowledge of uh, collaborative working. So there was no requirement to develop that know-how or skills, uh, either, either within the discipline itself or within the context of multidisciplinary international relationships, which was quite staggering find, really, when you consider the importance of international collaboration and collaboration in general in the engineering profession. Um, and we considered what should be done about this, and, and it was very clear that adding specific learning outcomes would prove really challenging because of the time scale it would take to get change uh, uh, implemented, which is long and then, you know, quite rightly long because there's a huge amount of governance associated with it, a huge amount of, of consensus building. And to change the learning outcomes within the UK spec, required of the UK spec uh, through the um, uh, UK Engineering Council would be extremely time consuming. And the reality is that many of these problems I laid out before you at the beginning of the talk need to be solved within a timescale that is far shorter than the timescale it would take for those changes to be made and to take effect globally. Um, you know, 2030 is only uh, eight years away, and many of those issues that I raised have really significant targets for 2030, which are going to rely on international collaboration. So what we looked for was opportunities within the existing le learning outcomes where the topic of co in collaboration and more specifically internationally, international collaboration could be logically integrated and look for intervention points. Uh, and we found that some of those quite, I suppose, quite obviously, but um, you know, it, was, it, it was necessary to do the, re the research to, to find that, were in modules for design, project management, dissertation assignments and, and, and project work. And we did indeed find some really excellent examples of innovative practice uh, in provision for engineering uh, within existing learning outcome requirements. So um, within the report, we, we highlight the work of the Open University, the University of Wales, Trinity St. David's, Brunel University and IIT Bombay in terms of being innovative within the constraints of the existing curriculum. And I would point you to some of those examples for, um, for inspiration. And of course, beyond the curriculum, there's opportunities for uh, early stage, early career engineers to gain collaborative skills. So, you know, I myself did a sandwich course, a, uh, a two one one. So two years in academia, one in industry, one back in academia. Uh, and, you know, sandwich courses are a great way to build industrial experience of, of collaboration. Um, sponsorships with summer's placements and international internships are, are really useful, and uh, uh, particularly in terms of developing that international dimension. 
uh, and exchanges uh, through various bodies, including the Association for the Exchange of Students for Technical Experience, uh, are really useful ways of, of not only technically collaborating, but, in, but getting involved in social and intercultural activity and networking activity that breaks down those misunderstandings around cultural norms and, um, uh, and, uh, and cultural preferences. And of course, we at the IMIC-E have our own engineering design challenge, which is as much about collaboration and communication skills as it is about developing technical ability. So there's a very real need for some strategies around international collaboration. And, and with our um, research, we, we looked at how we might go about reversing isolate, isolationism and what kind of national policy responses we might need to do that. And sort of underpinning the need for this is the, 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 the issue that it's, it, it's so critically important that for tackling the, these challenges of climate change, biodiversity loss, ecos, ecosystem class, mass species extinction, all the things I mentioned at the beginning, uh, widespread air, water and land degradation, all the things we've been working on at the institution for, for many years. Um, you know, it's absolutely essential that we reverse isolationism if we're going to stand any realistic uh, possibility of, of tackling those. And we need to reach out to nations, both large and small, uh, to create these engineering based collaborations across industry, business, public sector, academia, etc. Um, and policy responses that might help uh, break down barriers and engender and nurture that kind of collaboration are things that will help us um, embed and implement that collaboration um, through strategies that we could put in, in international policy uh, that addresses these, these pressing global challenges. And, and we, there's a real need to uh, look at this from a holistic whole systems perspective um, that enables us to um, you know, take take that global view um, and drive collaboration that that meets those challenges with sustainability at its core. Um, so these national policy responses really need to nurture and sustain these international collaborations. So what might these uh, policy recommendations look like from the IMEC-E. So what we're calling on within the report is for governments uh, to develop and, inter and, and implement international strategies for collaboration. Um, you know, the, we spent some time looking at the UK's uh, industrial strategy and there was very little in there around international collaboration uh, and the need to nurture it and grow it to help help tackle these global problems. And it's these kind of strategies that need to embed international collaboration within them to drive industrial business and public sector collaboration around these core issues. So we're calling on government when developing strategies uh, for uh, tackling some of these major societal challenges that they build international collaboration and the need for that and interventions that help drive that within those strategies. And industry, business and the public sector itself must recognise the importance of international collaboration uh, in, in helping to tackle these issues. And, it, and in doing so, it really needs to address that issue that I raised earlier about empowering managers uh, to support their teams uh, in meeting those challenges. Um, so often we found that that managers just lacked the skills, the ability and the, the room to manoeuvre to tackle these challenges within, within the workplace. And uh, ourselves as a, as a professional body for engineering and our sister professional bodies have a big role to play within this, uh, within, within this uh, uh, ecosystem of encouraging international collaboration in that we are central to helping 
engineers realize their career aspirations through continuous professional development and through their early uh, stage of career learning and knowledge gaining at university and in the early stages beyond and, and in technical colleges, um, we, we really need to be proactive in, in looking at how opportunities to enable the profession to uh, prepare engineers at all stages on their professional journey to, to meet this challenge of effective and efficient international collaboration. So that was a very uh, uh, quick and um, uh, high level run through the main uh, background to the report, the findings of the report, and, um, and the sort of things that the report uh, is encouraging uh, our community to do. And um, I would strongly recommend that you have a look at the report um, and uh, and treat it as a indeed as a as it as it is positioned as a manifesto for the future of international engineering collaboration and um, take on board some of the insights that 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 we present within that piece of work. So thank you very much for your time, and I'm happy to answer uh, questions. Uh, for, uh, for as long as we need to do so. Thank you. I'll stop sharing the screen. Thank you very much, Tim. I do have some questions here in true faith of technology, knowing how hard it is to scroll back up chat. I've handwritten them all out. Also, I can read my own handwriting better than I can read. <laughs> so there's two actually. I'm, I'm not going to go in order because they're linked together. So. Uh, when you spoke about culture and behavior ch behavioral challenges, one thing I keep this person asking is managing partnerships with organizations or countries with differing human rights, business ethics, how do you manage it where the outcome of the project is very noble and very justified, but you're possibly not totally comfortable with the behavior and values of your partner? Now, this second question that links to this actually quite nicely, so you can probably answer the two in one, is, could international collaboration cause excessive interdependencies? And what are the risks of the collaboration of te the collaborative technology being hijacked for military or possibly non ethical outcomes? So if you'd like to just try and cover those in one response. Yeah, um, really good questions and, uh, and uh, very deep questions, very, uh, very deeply challenging questions. So um, I think with it, Within within the report um, and within the work we did for the report, um, the cultural and behavioural changes that we were looking at um, were really um, uh, on a uh, on a on more of a what I might term day to day basis um, than those really large scale challenges around whether there's a fundamental difference in um, perspectives and attitudes on human rights, for example. Um, you know, the sort of cultural and behavioral changes we were thinking about and, and exploring within the report were more to do with the way in which people treat each other within the workplace and what their expectations are of that and what their expectations are of what how it is uh, um, perceived as reasonable to behave within the workplace. So what I might, might call more day-to-day -day operational uh, issues around culture and behaviour. I think, I think those questions that of, you know, really significant differences in attitudes towards human rights um, and, and, and similar types of topics was really uh, not within the scope of what we discussed within the report and I think is is something that would need a deeper piece of work than we were able to undertake within the report. So I, I wouldn't like to comment too deeply on that without having done the work um, because that really is a very challenging area. Um, similarly in a way high you know we, we were considering uh, collaboration where um, you know, I suppose I suppose the question really, the second part of the question really, or the second question really 
could relate to what we were exploring in terms of intellectual intellectual property rights. Um, if we're talking about hijacking technology and hijacking the project re results, and that it really is a significant um, a potential threat to the international collaboration, and um, and there are, you know, we we clearly lay out within the report that there are diff very diff strong differences of opinion around what what is normal and what is not normal in the way in which you treat intellectual property rights in different countries, and and I guess. Um, you know, from a from a project management point of view, that that is the sort of thing that that needs to be understood. That those first, it's important to understand that those differences are there, and then, which in many cases, it you know, I've been involved in projects where people haven't considered the IPR until the project's done and it's too late. Um, you know, so recognizing that that issue is there, and then. Um, you know, putting in place protocols and understandings and working really hard at those understandings at the beginning of the project to try to avoid that issue uh, coming to the fore. So I get, you know, what we're calling for is for more of these kind of uh, questions to be discussed within the um, learning process that takes place within the education system um, that prepares engineers to enter the profession and then within our own CPD activities within the profession. So those questions would would really make very suitable discussion topics, uh, you know, in, in, in a educational environment. And, and to those of us of more advanced years, this sits very much with what used to be called uh, engineering society. It used to be an exam. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, became part of the interview, uh, but it yeah. was actually a fundamental part before the UK spec appeared. Yeah, yeah. Right, so I'll do take one more from the incomings and then I'll uh, go see what other ones we've got. About to say that, right. So international collaboration is very important, but what are we also doing to look at developing internal collaboration in amongst in amongst academic institutions within individual countries? What the suggestion is here is there is actually isolationism within nations as well. Hmm. Yeah, and um, certainly we 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 found that within the work that we did. Um, you know the the project the project that we we set out to uh, to do was really focused on international collaboration, and it would have been very easy for us to get sidetracked into you know sect uh, uh, barriers within sectors and barriers within sub sectors of those sectors and uh, you know within a a, a a sector such as academia but um but we kept our focus on that international collaboration piece because that was the the mandate that was put to us for for the project by the Europe region of the IMACE. that was the the objective to explore that so we did come across this but you know, we didn't we didn't move into those areas, and it is really, you know, there there is many of the th areas that we address within the report, um, you know, could equally apply within um, at that institutional level or at that national level. You know, so many of the things we 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 uh, look at in the report were uh, are not only international but but could be seen in, in those areas, and and so improving. You know, we as I said earlier, we we found that within the curriculum, within the learning outcomes, there's there's no requirement to teach collaboration, let alone international collaboration. And actually, on that subject, I'll I'll change my order then, because I'll go to uh, no point in recommendations. Are you pointing towards the university's duty to train collaboration? Uh, obviously, you mentioned it. You it, rewriting the UK spec is not a quick process but to actually encourage the academic establishments to start training our young engineers in collaboration. Yeah, so. certainly the, you know, the, 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 the two, the, the three one liners that I presented on, you know, in the, in the talk were, you know, very short process of the, the sort of the nub of those recommendations. The recommendations in the report are you know, considerably more lengthy and, um, and do highlight that issue within 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 the the recommendation for the profession for our profession. OK, so is there any questions from the room? So I've still got a few more here. So any questions within the? Uh, I'll, con I'll, I'll 
Oh, oh do I need? No, no. I'll no, just... okay. Um, been pondering what you have been saying about isolationism and perhaps putting it in opposition to globalization. Um, there, was, there was a time when it was a kind of badge of honor for every nation to have its own airline, for example. Um, and and that, that wasn't very successful because we ended up with a lot of really rather inefficient airlines, um, didn't do a very good job. And what we now have, a, set of, a smaller set of globalized airlines seems to work a lot better. But there has been a consequence to that, I think, hasn't there? That, that, that there are nations now that I suspect have got very little native expertise in in aeronautics and so on, because they haven't got the, their own domestic industry. And, and you might say the same about um, making vaccines and so on. But, you know, the UK discovered, to its surprise, that it didn't have a domestic vaccine industry when it needed one. So, um, I, I find myself a bit split here as an engineer. I like the idea of globalization. I think we might build a smaller number of much more efficient, innovative companies um, that will achieve something really big, really quickly, which is what I think you've said we need. But if I were running, you know, a nation, um, I would want to have my own domestic industry, even if it was less efficient, I think. I, how, how do we... What, what do you feel about that question? It seems to me to be quite a fundamental one. Yeah, so um, I think you have to, uh, I, f I totally understand uh, your point. And, um, you know, as somebody who entered the aerospace industry initially, uh, you know, post sort of, you know, uh, graduation, um, there, you know, that there, there was always this desire back then to you know to maintain the nation's sort of aeronautical and aerospace capability but um two things i you know and and we've seen where they're gone you know through collaborations like the eurofighter the um lockheed martin x35 that became the you know the jsf fighter you know all these airbus all these kind of collaborations um the reality is that the uk makes the wings and uh, you know other places make the engines and all the rest of it and um, we don't have expertise in in those areas, and and I mean that is fundamentally a sort of an economic reality of where we are now. These technologies are incredibly expensive, and um, and they're incredibly expensive not only uh, you know to 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 uh, produce, they're incredibly expensive to do all that R and D and etc. So the sort of reality is that unless you're a very big nation like the United States, um, you know, with a huge economy, or China. Um, you're going to struggle to to have all those capabilities, but that's sort of a a sort of a a side conversation, if you don't mind me saying, relative to what we were addressing in the report, which is, you know, the the sort of exam question was, we face these huge global societal challenges around climate change and ecosystems and n natural resource degradation and all the rest of it, and you know, so we, we, there's no one nation on the on the planet that can solve those. You know, many of the most of these issues do not respect national boundaries. They they cross boundaries in an instant. Think of the pandemic. Think of climate change. You know, they, there's no national boundaries to these. So by default, they need international collaboration uh, to 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 successfully tackle. And they're so big. And they involve such large systems that, you know, again, no one nation could could undertake um, a, a program that would meet that challenge. So international collaboration is absolutely critical to achieving these things. And we as engineers are absolutely critical to achieving a successful outcome to tackling these issues. Um, so if we're going to do it, we're going to need to collaborate internationally. I think this is quite a different challenge to that sort of industrial commercial challenge of, you know, should we be able to make aircraft engines or not? Thanks, Tim. That's what you mentioned there is like offshoring of knowledge, offsh offshoring uh, and the risk of offshoring of knowledge. That links back into a question here, which is like, Identifying and selecting the appropriate things for UK to collaborate with others on is important too. So how how should UK PLC 
actually select topics for discussion with others. Which, what should we be offshore if necessary? And, and, and yep. what systems are in place to actually select that offshoring? Yeah, so again, you know, focusing on the topic of the report, which is, you know, the topic of, you know, the, the last few decades of my career, which has been, you know, climate change, sustainability, ecosystem degradation, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, in the UK, we have certain areas of distinct expertise in science and engineering and technology that can help tackle that. Um, there are many areas in combination with those areas that need to come together to tackle these challenges across borders. And when we are looking to form these international programs, we need to be looking to bring partners together that you know, have complementary sets of technologies and techniques to um, to meet them. So, um, you know, it's really a question of looking at your expertise areas and then looking for uh, the elements that you you haven't got time. We have not got the time to develop to tackle these challenges, and we haven't got the resources to develop. So, we need to look for collaborators, and this comes back to the. The core of the sort of success factor that uh, we found within the work that this success that the key two elements to the success of any collaborative project and particularly an international collaborative project is the the corralling of the professions around a common goal and mission that everybody is totally focused on and the bringing together of partners that want to work together um, because they recognize each other's skill sets, respect each other's skill sets, and intuitively know what that partner is bringing to the table. Um, and they are the best collaborations. So, you know, whether you're collaborating as a SME with other SMEs uh, and local university departments, or whether you're a nation looking to collaborate internationally, those success factors are exactly the same. And in developing our industrial strategy, um, we, you know, the part of it that's focused on dealing with these, uh, what used to be called grand challenges, but that's dropped out of the parlance, policy parlance now. But, you know, in dealing with those global big, big, big challenges, um, we need to be looking for to, to bring together collaborations around those success factors. Thank you. So the last pair of last two questions here. So these are about practicalities of delivery. So first one was what methods are suggested to ensure all participants contributors adhere to the project timeline schedules? And the second one is mechanical engineering traditionally follows waterfall type project structures, which can become difficult to navigate when having multiple work streams taking place across multiple countries, time zones. Is this now time to adopt a more agile philosophy? And how do we overcome inertia to win this in many mechanical engineering environments? That's the challenge. Yeah, so the first one, um, I think, uh, uh, talks to the part of the report where we were looking at um, when you first form these collaborative teams to, um, you know, have a common understanding of what the most appropriate tools and approaches are to, um, you know, to, to, to enable you to work successfully within the project. And as I said, there's a, there's a huge amount of work to be done at the beginning of a project to sort out um, what those tools are and and how you can successfully use them as a team. Um, so yeah, fully recognizing that those tools are, are absolutely key to to make you know to to success. But as I said earlier, um, if you have those success factors I mentioned a few moments ago, then those sort of issues can be overcome. The second question you're going to have to repeat a little bit because I kind of missed a bit of it. It basically is talking about traditional traditional methods of project delivery are not that agile. We need this type of collaboration will require a much more agile method of delivery. Yeah, and I I, I think um, you know I point you to the two case studies within the report um, for the response to the COVID nineteen pandemic nineteen pandemic. Um, the Fuji and the UCL project. We, we came across quite a few of these examples, but we chose these two for the report. And, and these were very, very kind of illustrative of, of, of 
the the need to respond in that agile way and to find new ways of working more you know in a more agile agile uh, format and um uh, i think you know those two case studies are incredibly inspirational to us as engineers because they they really show what can be done when engineers come together and integrate other professions like the medical you know doctors and uh, physicians surgeons you know etc social um scientists to to solve these problems where that mission and goal is the imperative and the partners have decided to work together um you know particularly that ucl one it's absolutely a superb example of a couple of engineers in the pub over a pint of beer deciding to do something about it and a hundred hours later it's done now that is an example of working agilely across a whole range of you know partners from you know a, a car car manufacturing company um, who repurposed its manufacturing capability to manufacture the, the the ventilators you know through to you know the doctors and the and and the um, regulators that were passing the units to you know for a fit for purpose can be done can be good. so can I hand you over to Claire Edwards now to close the evening Hello, Tim. Hello, um, Claire. I'm so sorry I'm not there to, to see you tonight. Go over. I mean, I have the pleasure of doing the vote of thanks. So, wow, you started this with the need for cross-border, cross-discipline and cross-border engineering collaboration has arguably never been so acute. And boy, did you mean it. Bring, it, <laughs> bring us to think about this in the context of the big issues that don't stop at borders, those on climate change, things you spoke about. I got into engineering because I was interested in maths and physics. And you just told me, actually, no, we might love the technology, but engineering collaboration is less about the technology and more about that human intervention, the behaviours, and challenging us to make sure that we build our language skills, we have the right leadership, we manage those relationships across cultures and really understand things in the wider context. So. Thank you very much for taking us through the history, but also coming to the end about what is, is we actually can do. What are those recommendations that we should be doing in the future? Not just talking about the subject, but hey, here's the positioning and what we can achieve. So thank you very much, Tim. And I'd love everybody to give you a massive applause. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tim. Right, Tim. Say goodbye. Thank you, and I enjoy the reception. <laughs> <laughs>